2,300 years ago, Alexander the Great invaded Asia, his goal to conquer the Persian Empire. We followed in his footsteps a 20,000-mile journey from Greece to the plains of India. By the fifth year of the war, Persia had fallen and the Persian king had been killed. Alexander now set out to overrun their vast eastern empire and he headed for Afghanistan. Kabul, Afghanistan. Our journey now brought us into a modern day war. A crossroads on the ancient routes to India, Kabul has been a battleground for more than 2,000 years. The city had been devastated by war. Alexander wintered here in the fifth year of his campaign. He founded a new city close by, another Alexandria. One more step towards uniting the world under Greek rule. For his teacher Aristotle had taught him it was fitting that Greeks should rule barbarians. Settled with Greek and native colonists, Alexander's city would foster a remarkable mixed culture, Greek and Asiatic. I was hoping to see its treasures in Kabul Museum. But that rich legacy, the glass from Egypt, the ivories from India, Chinese lacquer, was all gone. What's left is locked down in the cellars, and even that has been looted and smashed. Oh, how did you feel when you saw this? Uh, when I came to the museum, I was a little bit of a long time. When we saw all this, the museum director said, it was as if our mother and father had died. Our whole history was here. Goodness me, look. The Buddhist head. Just look at that. Look, here's a... There's a Greek period Buddha. He's wearing a Greek toga. That's the kind of fusion of East and West that happened in the art too in Afghanistan. This was an absolutely unique civilization. And this museum, the chief record of it in the world. Oh, it's just heartbreaking. It was a somber introduction to Afghan history, but this is a tale of war and war destroys the past as well as the present. Now, we had no idea what to expect on the road ahead. 
As Alexander saw it that winter, the eastern part of the Persian Empire was still unconquered. The Greek historian Arian says a Persian nobleman, Bessus, had proclaimed himself king of Asia and was rallying resistance. It was Bessus who had murdered the previous king, Darius. Now he'd retreated north beyond the Hindu Kush mountains, thinking Alexander wouldn't try to cross till the snows had gone. Alexander took up the challenge. The next stage of our journey was to follow Alexander over the Hindu Kush, but to get out there we needed a vehicle. Hmm, certainly is a Land Rover. So, do you think we'll get all the way up the Pantheon with this? Yes, I'm sure. Really? I'm the real one from Of course, all over Afghanistan. Really? <laughs> So you're the expert then, are you, Mr. Zalman? Alexander had burned his wagons when he entered Afghanistan. They slowed the army, they were always breaking down. So his troops crossed the country entirely on foot or horseback. Yes, it's especially made for the bad route of Afghanistan. B, B. See. Early in the spring, Alexander set off. Ahead of him, the great mass of the Hindu Kush, which rises to 20,000 feet. On the other side, his enemy Bessus was waiting. There were three main passes. Bessus expected Alexander to come the direct route, and he devastated the land there to deny Alexander supplies. But Alexander never did what was expected. He chose the longer eastern route and went up the Panchia Valley, heading for the Khawak Pass. Traveling up the Panchia Valley today, it's almost impossible to believe that a great army could have made its way through here. But they did. Throughout the whole of history, armies had to find a way over the Hindu Kush. And uh, this tended to be the favorite route. Uh, Tamburlaine the Great, for example, came this way on his way from the Oxus to India in 1398. And your main problem, especially in the spring, was not the terrain, but was the cold and especially the lack of food and provisions. And as it turned out, that was exactly the problem that Alexander faced. The local people had buried their winter supplies to foil the Macedonian foragers, so Alexander's men had to take their own food with them. Our Land Rover soon began to struggle. Alexander had been right. Wheeled vehicles can be a liability on these roads. Handbrake off. The Russians also found their mechanized gear failed here against men fighting on foot and supplied by mule. Eventually, our Land Rover would go no further. Davey, can you hear me? We've developed a very bad clonking noise suddenly. It sounds as if it could be the half shop. So we're, we're going to pull in, OK? And it wasn't the last of our problems. 
The road is uh, closed. The road is closed? Yeah, because of uh, landslide. Oh. And where is this? Could you ask the gentleman? Uh, just uh, after five minutes, we will oh, reach really? there. Really? Uh. And, and impossible for vehicles to get through? Or? No, it's impossible. Only donkeys? <laughs> told you we should use donkeys on this part of the trip. <laughs> How long do you think it will take a bulldozer to clear it? Bulldozer, one hour. One hour? Yes, one hour. One hour, I'm hour. Yes, but then they have to build the road again. Oh. Look, the road has gone. We were obviously here for the night, so we went back to the nearest village. What is the name of the village where we leave the cars and we start to walk up to the pass? Hawak. 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 Yeah, that's Hawak. Yeah, that's Hawak. Yeah, that's Hawak. And Hawak, Hawak, Hawak village. And Hawak is after Dash Te Reba. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Alexander always used local guides. If they did well, they were rewarded. If they misled him, they were killed. Simple but effective. Is it easy to find the men with the horses? So Halil organizes the... In fact, Alexander's sappers and engineers are one of the keys to his speed of movement. They did this kind of job for him all the way to India. We abandoned our Land Rover and took a lift on towards the foot of the pass. The track began to rise now. We passed travellers walking in long zigzags up the hillsides. It was easy to imagine the Macedonians doggedly trudging forward. actually only made up for cars a few years ago and until that point it was really a track that only horses could use and although Alexander's army must have been able to uh, come along the river valley in that, those wide open spaces in the early part of the Panchir here they would have been single file so it would have taken them hours to pass any given point and the army must have stretched for 10 miles who knows maybe all the way back down the Panchir which explains why it took 17 days to cross Finally, we reached our goal, the horse station below the pass. And there was Commander Halil. It's a bit like the Wild West out here, and for a moment, the atmosphere seemed threatening. Well, how much does it cost per, per horse? to take a horse over from here in Al-Khawak 
all the way to Andorra over the pass. Mega az aminje ta khod khawaka, tam kutale khawaka. Ki as pas ni amroy mabura. Pas be qimat es chand es aminje ta unje chand es pas me chand es chekhasam shuma amir. Ta khawaka ba chand ni Don't tell me he doesn't know. It's uh, the price of uh, per horse is uh, 60,000 yeah. Afghani, okay. but you are our guest, uh, we will yeah. give you a discount, 50,000 oh, Afghani very kind. That's very, that's very kind. And to our man will escort you oh, to the top of pass. That's very kind. That's for your safety. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We loaded up. Our pack horses took a hundred kilos each, the same as Alexander's. His men, though, had to carry their own gear and backpacks. That would get tough at high altitude. All along the route, to my surprise, we saw people, traders, refugees, families. The Khawak was still the thoroughfare to the north, as it's been throughout history. <laughs> that night, we ate with the local commander, he recognized our cameraman, Peter, who'd covered the war with the Russians. We were the first Westerners through here since then. <coughs> On Alexander's march, the Greeks said, the people here had never seen foreigners before. <laughs> There's always been discreet about money. <laughs> As Arian says, Alexander's mind was now totally concentrated on defeating Bessus. And here on the pass that night, I could almost feel the magnetism of Alexander's leadership and the sheer excitement that his men must have felt marching with him. Next day, the track went higher, the air was thinner, and the land more barren. For us, as no doubt for the Greeks, walking was now an effort. As the crossing went into its second week, they ran out of grain and started killing the pack animals for food. But there was no firewood for cooking, and they had to eat the flesh raw. This they did, says Arian, with the juice of a medicinal plant, silphium. So can you ask which, which part of the plant they use for medicine? <laughs> And from the yeah. So you get a juice out of it, do you? Okay, yeah, get some shiram dora. Oh, shiram dora. Yeah, yeah. And you can use. Yeah, it's all about jam, yeah, boy. Jam, yeah, boy. Jam. What are the things you pay for, Megan? To use this for flatulence, stomach pain, and uh, swelling. 
And for, for cuts as well, this kind of thing? Or? Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. 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 Yeah, It's a tiny detail, but just imagine it. Cold water, raw horse meat, and the bitter juice of the sylphium. They were over 11,000 feet now, and the starving troops were suffering from chronic fatigue brought on by altitude sickness. We'd brought few supplies with us, and we took our snacks where we could find them. They say this is good stuff for, um, for long distance traveling. The uh, this dried mulberries compressed together, and it's the kind of dried fruit that the Mujahideen lived on and during the war with the Russians in these mountains. It keeps your energy up. At such times, Alexander was inspirational. He'd run up and down the column, cheering the men, giving a helping hand, lifting those who'd fallen, unflagging. Just below the summit, there was gunfire. Our guards raced off. There were bandits ahead. Mike, can you get out of the way? It's dangerous. Here is some highway men and robber. They see the uh, situation favorable for uh, the robbery and uh, for uh, their uh, here. Uh, take everything like food stuff and money okay. and everything that we have yes we should be very careful here yes so we're good targets in other words yes yeah, yeah. they carry on arms with the <laughs> 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 Half an hour later, we got the all clear. Finally, we reached the top and saw the view Alexander's men had seen all those years before. We're here, Shazad. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. We made it. The top of the Kamak Pass is about 12,000 feet, and there the road stretching away down to the land of Bactria and former Soviet Central Asia and around us the mountains of the Hindu Kush. The Greeks knew that these mountains were part of a continuous uh, chain which split Asia in two and was the source of all the great rivers of Asia. And following Ale Alexander's footsteps up here with this wind, you can really feel, whatever you think about him, what an amazing achievement it was to drive an army over these mountains. Nothing stopped him, said the historian Arian. Nothing put him off. He just kept coming on and on. Whatever the cold or the starvation, he drove on, and in the end, his enemies were struck with fear at the speed of his advance. I'll bet they were. Bessus was nowhere to be seen. The gamble had paid off. Just below the summit, a cairn of stones is said to mark the burial place of the Greeks who didn't make it. On the other side of the Hindu Kush, in northern Afghanistan, they found good fishing in the rivers. There were big herds of livestock, too.
There was plenty of grain here. They could draw breath and fill their bellies. We, though, were still traveling through a civil war. We now had to cross the lands of the local warlord, and there was the tricky matter of a front line to negotiate. I have a letter from General Harun. As chance would have it, I'd met the head of the local garrison in London before we set out. He'd written me a letter of introduction to his frontline commanders. Okay. You are most welcome to Pulihumbi. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, I'll wait then. So we waited. With the fundamentalist armies of the Taliban closing in on Kabul, we weren't too keen to retrace our steps. Welcome to my country, to my province. It's very nice to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> I told you when I was in London that I would okay. finally get Welcome here. Welcome to my country. And you can keep this later, you know, for next time if you come. Uh, it'll be a nice souvenir. I'll stick it on my notice board. I'll just get my bag. Yeah, sure. Come on. We'll look back to you. Okay. Arun's career has had its ups and downs. He once delivered pizzas in Pennsylvania. Then he was summoned home by the family to a very different life. At the beginning, it was so difficult for me, but now I used to it, you know. Yeah. You can just be travelling along a quiet country road and you run into some group that you've never heard of who decide yeah. they want to kidnap you for a bit. Of course, yeah. That... But there's, you know, uh, what I believe that, you know, this time of life is in Afghanistan is more uh, risky than, than the 16 years ago, than the beginning of the revolution. Yeah. So is your life in, in danger yeah. frequently here? Of course, yes. In this country, even your life yeah. is in danger yeah. in the country, this country. Alexander, though, met no resistance. The people of this part of Bactria, the Greeks said, are prosperous. They grow grapes here and have all manner of fruits. It was a little haven. <laughs> A warlord's house wasn't quite what I expected, but soldiers are the same everywhere, I guess, for all the guns and high-tech. The Macedonians, perhaps, were much like the Afghans, brave, tough, pious. They lived hard and played hard, like soldiers throughout history. The news that night was gloomy. Rockets were falling on Kabul. We'd got through just in time. By this morning, they had advanced more than 20 kilometers into the southern outskirts of the capital. Reports from Kabul say the fighting has now eased, but the government forces say they're preparing for a counterattack. Next day, as we got ready to head north, Harun's tanks were rumbling through the streets. They were moving their forces back towards the mountains. Poor Afghanistan. Now I began to understand Alexander's world. We hired a battered Russian pickup and drove on in Alexander's tracks. Bessus was on the run and Alexander pursued him like a hunter towards the river Oxus, which divides Afghanistan from Central Asia.
We're just coming into Tashkogan. Uh, it was the first of the ancient Bactrian cities that Alexander the Great reached when he came down off the Hindu Kush. But today, Tashkogan is run by Hizb Islami, one of the fundamentalist parties here in Afghanistan. They don't like the West, they don't like the BBC, and they don't like journalists, so we'll probably uh, give their hospitality a miss tonight. I just won't, won't believe what just happened. We actually broke down right in the middle of Tashkogan. We just stalled right in front of the border post. Unfortunately, there was a sandstorm had blown up and it was just sunset, so every, everybody must have been at their Friday prayers. So um, we just covered up the camera and all the gear and sat tight while Tim helped the driver to mend the engine. It was summer now, and Alexander was racing for the river Oxus. The road goes through a wasteland covered by moving sand dunes, just as the Greeks describe. But they weren't carrying enough water, and they lost their way. Imagine, it was midsummer, blazing heat. They had to cross this great belt of shifting sand dunes, and they had no water. They probably had to camp here for two nights. And then they made the fundamental, unbelievable mistake of broaching the wine supplies because they had nothing else to drink. It made them feel better for the moment, said one of the Alexander historians, but the after effects were terrible. Maybe they had no choice, but Alexander's elite ended up hung over and dehydrated, stumbling over sand dunes, trying to find the Oxus River. The Greeks reached this place just about the same time of the day, late afternoon, early evening. And when they saw the river, the troops were so thirsty that they all piled down to the riverbanks and just started drinking. And there were a lot of deaths due to over-consumption of the water of the river, which isn't particularly good, apparently. In desperation, Bessas had burned all the riverboats, but Alexander made rafts from tents stuffed with straw and ferried his troops across in five days. Bessas was running out of places to hide. Our journey now took us into Central Asia, to Uzbekistan, and the road to Samarkand. Despite the intense heat, Alexander advanced relentlessly. Then, a very strange thing happened. Somewhere on this road, Alexander came to a small town. To his surprise, the people here spoke Greek. As Alexander and his officers strolled around, they saw Greek faces in the marketplace. The townspeople had quite a tale to tell. Their ancestors had been Greeks from the Aegean coast of Turkey. Though bilingual now, they still kept up Greek customs. but they had a dark secret. Their ancestors were the priestly family of the Temple of Didyma, the Branchidae. 
150 years before, they'd collaborated with the Persians in the hated war which Alexander had vowed to avenge. So what would Alexander do now? Salam. Early next morning, Alexander came through the gate with a small detachment of troops, apparently to receive the hospitality of the Branchidae. Teshikov. In fact, during the night, the army had been given instructions to surround the town. And at a prearranged signal, they began to attack, with the intention of massacring everybody inside. The Branchidae had suspected nothing. But despite their kinship of language, their desperate entreaties, the fact that they were holding olive branches in their hands, the symbol of peace, the savagery didn't stop until everybody had been killed. And afterwards, the Greeks leveled the town, destroyed its walls, and even cut down its woods and sacred groves so that no trace remained. The expedition historian, Callisthenes, did his best to justify the massacre. The aim of Alexander's crusade, after all, had been to punish Persian wrongs. Arian, though, says nothing. I imagine he felt that, however you gloss it over, a war crime is still a war crime. Alexander now received word that support for Bessus was crumbling in the face of the Macedonians' lightning advance. Alexander sent his general Ptolemy on ahead to arrest him. The last resistance in the Persian Empire, he thought, had now collapsed. Ptolemy left Alexander behind, pushed on as fast as he could up this road towards Samarkand with light-armed cavalry. He did a 10-day march in four days. This kind of heat, summer heat, really hard men. Bessus' supporters were just terrified. They turned him over to the Greeks. When Alexander arrived, he was standing by the roadside, humiliated, naked, in a wooden dog collar. Bessus met a gruesome end. His nose and ears were cut off, and he was sent back to Persia to be impaled the Persian punishment for traitors. Alexander pushed on to the Sir Daria River, the outermost edge of the Persian Empire. Here he founded a city, which he called Alexandria the Fathermost. It's still here today, Hojent in Tajikistan. To understand why he stopped here, we have to imagine the world as he saw it. As far as he knew, he was near the northern edge of the world here. Beyond the Sir Daria lay only a belt of arid plains as far as the great ocean which encircled the earth. There was no point in going any further. To mark his northern limit, Alexander built altars to his favorite god Dionysus, perhaps on the very spot where now there's a great statue of Lenin monument to another tide of history which has come and gone. It's a nice place, the farthermost. I think the Greek colonists might have felt quite at home here, figs and olives in the market. Alexander said he hoped the town would one day become rich and famous. Perhaps he remembered the words of his teacher, Aristotle, that civilization will only thrive on cities and trade. Ah, oh, thank you. Mr. Bond, show us some. I don't understand. Money. Money? Oh. <laughs> this is shush, shush. 
16. Hojent was one of more than 20 Alexandrias the king founded between Egypt and India. The empire was linked by a system of post horses and racing camels. The troops received letters from home. Medical supplies came out here by the ton. Oh, oh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Alexander even had his favorite books and fresh fruits sent out here from Greece. My parcel came from a friend in Athens. <laughs> Great, a Greek newspaper. That's nice to have. Olives, Greek olives. Aristotle was right. The fruits of civilization. Ah, a bottle of Naosa. But the local people were not prepared to buy into the idea of a Greek world empire. That summer, the famed horsemen of Bactria were gathering. The Sogdians, too, came out in revolt. For 2,000 years or more, they bred the finest horses in Asia here, and they fought the kind of war Alexander had not prepared for. No battles, just hit and run. You can imagine what he was up against when you see them play Buz Kashi. And this is just a game. Alexander couldn't beat us because we were such good horsemen, the old man said. Even an eight-year-old could ride and throw a spear. As horsemen, we had greatness. Our forefathers used to say, the horse is the wings of the man. A horse is strong and fearless, like a fierce spirit. In heavy fighting, Alexander was seriously wounded in the head and throat and lost both sight and speech. Worse was to follow. A Macedonian column was wiped out near Samarkand, their first defeat in 30 years. At his base on the Sir Daria River, he suddenly found himself crippled and at bay. Alexander was now one of the lowest points in his entire career. Surrounded by enemies, he was suffering from a leg wound, he had malnutrition, dysentery coming on, his throat wound had not healed, so he could hardly speak, his voice was so quavering the people even close to him couldn't hear him. He couldn't stand in the ranks, he couldn't ride a horse, he couldn't give his army encouragement and instructions, the very thing on which his generalship depended. There's a vivid image of Alexander at this moment, opening his tent flap at night to gaze across the river at the twinkling fires of the nomad armies. Being Alexander, though, he had to act. He forced his way across the river and won a stunning victory, even though his dysentery was now so bad he had to be carried back. Now began his hardest war. That winter, he regrouped in bulk. The next spring, massively reinforced, he took fire and sword across Central Asia. Five mobile army groups, 50,000 men, spread up the river valleys of Tajikistan in a search and destroy operation almost as far as China. In the autumn, they reunited at Samarkand. Samarkand, the most famous and glamorous city on the Silk Route. In Alexander's day, 
It was the chief town of Sogdia, today's Uzbekistan. Here, that September, took place one of the most fateful incidents of Alexander's life. Just outside the city gate lies the mound of the ancient town and the remains of the Sogdian palace. One night, Alexander held a banquet here. Among the guests was a veteran cavalry officer called Clytus. One of Alexander's father's generation, Clytus had saved Alexander's life back in the early days. With everyone drunk, the evening turned nasty. Alexander was harping on about his relationship with his father. Clearly felt very embittered and competitive. It's real Freudian stuff. My father never gave me the credit for my part in his victories, he said. Bore me ill will and jealousy. Clytus, who was one of the old gods, stood up. He said, everything you have achieved was based on what your father did. In fact, your father's achievements are far greater than yours. And he won them fighting men, not women. At this point, Alexander, who'd been relatively calm and unruffled, flew into a rage. He threw fruit at Clytus, tried to grab a spear in order to hit him, and kept calling out in Macedonian to give the alarm for the royal bodyguards to come in. Alexander's friends, meanwhile, had grabbed hold of Clytus, and they pulled him out of the door and actually got him across the moat over there. But just when everybody thought everything was over, in comes Clytus again. Here I am, Alexander. Alexander grabs a long spear from one of the guards at the door and runs him through. There's blood everywhere. And Alexander collapses onto the body in a drink-sodden heap in floods of tears. Some said Clytus got what was coming to him, and the king now suspended freedom of speech. But at the tomb of Tamburlaine, Another tyrant or hero, depending on your point of view, the words of an eyewitness came to mind, who spoke of the fear which people round Alexander now felt. He was a very violent man, with no regard for human life, who was said to be melancholy mad. Meanwhile, Alexander had still not crushed the Central Asian revolt, the ringleaders were holding out in the rugged mountains on the Tajik-Uzbek border. With their wives and children, they'd taken refuge on an inaccessible peak known as the Sogdian Rock. But where was the rock? It's never been found. We were sleeping at a village high in the mountains, hearing of our search for the rock, over breakfast, the local men showed us an old manuscript of the Alexander legend. There were old traditions, they said, that Alexander had come this way and that the lost citadel of Sogdia lay in the mountains close by. Stories like this are ten a penny in these parts where you'll find Alexander's legend everywhere but my ears pricked up when they began to tell us about a mountain, a day's walk from their village. This their forefathers had told them was the Sogdian rock. They offered to take us there. It seemed worth a try. The mountain lies right in the heart of ancient Sogdia. It's called Hazrati Sultan. It's 14,000 feet high, and the last few thousand feet form a sheer cliff. The Sogdians thought they were safe. Alexander was about to give up attempting to seize the Sogdian rock. 
for one of the ambassadors who came down from the Sogdians irritated him so much, Arian says, that he had to go on and seize it in pursuit of glory. The ambassador simply said, in response to Alexander's demand for them to surrender, just find soldiers who can fly. Nobody else is going to be of any concern to us. Alexander asked for volunteers with experience in mountain climbing. 300 men came forward, herdsmen from the Macedonian uplands. They took ropes, made pitons from iron tent pegs. The climb was difficult enough for our local guides, but Alexander's men did it at night, on the back face where they wouldn't be seen. On the other side, a narrow path led to a ravine which was massively defended. Thirty-two of Alexander's climbers died on the rock. Dawn the next day, Alexander's 300 mountaineers appeared over the top of the ridge up there, waving flags. The barbarians, said Arian, were absolutely staggered. They had simply not thought it was possible. Alexander's herald rushed up to their front line and shouted across to them. You better surrender now, he said. You see, I found the soldiers who could fly. The rebels gave up there and then. The story was remembered ever after as proof of Alexander's almost superhuman powers. But now comes the most amazing twist in the tale. For a peace was finally broken, not through war, but through love. At least, that was how the Greeks told it. One night, a splendid banquet was held by one of the Sogdian barons, Alexander's erstwhile enemy, Oxyates. It was a feast of typical barbarian splendor, the Greeks said. I imagine not unlike the great Uzbek wedding feasts you see today. At the feast was the Baron's beautiful daughter, Roxanne, Little Star. She'd been captured on the Sogdian rock. Now, with her girlfriends, she danced before the king. When Alexander set eyes on her, Arian says, it was love at first sight. With the same impulsiveness which had killed Clytus, Alexander proposed to Roxanne. With his sword, he cut the bread, as they still do to mark an engagement in Uzbek land. He was 29, she at a guest in her mid-teens. His friends were staggered, to put it mildly. He'd had a relationship with a woman before, but his real intimacies, emotional and physical, had been with men. And to cap it all, he ordered some of his generals to marry the local women too. Was it really love, or just a clever political ploy? Who can say? Alexander's marriage with Roxanne sealed the conquest of Central Asia. He now returned with his new bride to Balkh in northern Afghanistan to prepare for the invasion of India. We flew there in a warlord's helicopter. Alexander's expedition would open up the heart of Asia and for a thousand years after the Greeks, Balkh would be the greatest crossroads on the Silk Route to China. You can 
can see its ruins below us, the walls stretching for seven miles with the remains of a hundred Buddhist monasteries, Zoroastrian fire temples, and later Christian and Jewish settlements, and the huge mosques of the Muslim period. When the Arabs came here in the seventh century, they called it simply the mother of cities. Fate, though, still had another card to play in this story. Here in bulk, Alexander announced that he wished to be worshipped as a god, Persian style. You can imagine how that went down among the Macedonian veterans. And now, for the first time, there was a serious plot against Alexander's life. A group of royal pages planned to assassinate him. They were betrayed and tortured to death. But the dissension over Alexander's divinity climaxed in a sensational falling out with the man who'd helped create Alexander's image, Aristotle's nephew, the historian Callisthenes. The final rift took place here in the citadel at Balkh after a, a bitter exchange. Callisthenes left the royal presence and turned to reiterate two or three times a single line from Alexander's favorite book, the Iliad. The line is this, a better man than you by far was Patroclus, but still death did not spare him. In other words, you're not a god, Alexander. The king's response was predictably savage. Using the page's plot as a pretext, he arrested Callisthenes and had him tortured and crucified. Of all Alexander's deeds, it was said, this left the bitterest taste. For everyone agreed Callisthenes was innocent, yet he was brutally killed without trial. It was the act of a tyrant. And as Aristotle said, no one freely endures such rule. Alexander had already achieved more, perhaps, than he could have dreamed, but now the question was no longer his ability to do things, but whether his men would still follow him on into the unknown. <laughs> 